Well, a bit closer. A bit closer. <laughs> Does it need to be any closer than that? Huh? <laughs> um, Sweet. Happy days. Uh, Mike, Tug, cheers with our coffee and water. Old, old men drinks, bud. Thank you very much. Yeah, sweet. Um, mate, appreciate your time. Uh, glad I got your time. Um, if you're at me, as this book, let's talk through. If you don't mind, talk through. We're going to talk through Kajaki, yeah. the incident, right? And uh, obviously, there's a, a film made about it. Um, but I find that the personal experiences, or it's like reading a book, right? Book always gives more detail than the film. And if you're going to hear something from the horse's mouth, then I think it's, it's even more powerful. And there's a few things that interest me anyway. Um, so the men, the mental aspect of it on the ground. Uh, so what, I, what I'll do is I'll just give an overview of the ground on the day. In Helmand, that's all right. And then I'll ask you to give the situation as it as it as it, as it started just for the incident. So, um, to my recollection, uh, so the day was known as the day of days, sixth of September, two thousand and six, and it was known as the day of days because there was m- multiple um, serious incidents going on uh, with the battle group in uh, in Helmand at that time. So, sang in DC was sixth of September, not the day Brian Budd got killed. Yep. Yeah, so 6th of September, you had the, the uh, Brian Wood um, got killed, and I was subsequently awarded the uh, Victoria Cross for his actions in Sangin, D.C. In Musakala, where I was at the time, uh, we took uh, six casualties on a roof. Uh, one of those was me. Um, from a airburst explosive. Um, so, already there across Sangin, D.C., you had, because Brian wasn't, wasn't, dead at the time you had casualties need to be extracted there Musakala you had five casualties need to be extracted there and in Kajaki on the same day um, you had a patrol about to go out to interdict a enemy threat Taliban uh, VCP and the patrols led by Stu Hale um, my oppo at the time so yeah so that's the overview of the day, a flipping nightmare of a day across the board, especially with limited resources. Two Chinooks, I think UK forces had at the time, amongst a lack of other things, right? So, stuff sang in DC, stuff Musakala. You were um, the one of the medics or the medic? One of the medics. You were one of the medics on the ground in Kajaki at that time with the company deployed there. Stand by, go. Cool. Um, about 11 o'clock on 6 September, uh, I remember Mark Wright running into my basher and telling me there'd been a mine strike incident on one of the hill posts. Stu Pearson, Stu Hale, and a number of the guys who were on one of the opposite uh, observation posts had witnessed the Taliban carrying out a legal vehicle checkpoint where they're extorting and assaulting civilians. Between the two stews, they made the decision that the sniper patrol was going to go out and eradicate the threat. Um, Stu and another two men got the kit ready, deployed off the hill, and uh, as they made their way down, they found themselves in an old sort of wadi that was there. And unfortunately, Stu Hale stood on a, a landmine that had been left from the Soviet um, sort of era war. About k k and a half, um, ten of us deployed off our hill, down the hill, up the other hill, and then we sort of got eyes on where the casualties, where Stu was at the time. Um, we went down into the minefield, Stu had lost his leg, um, had injuries to his fingers, and a couple of other injuries, and there's a young Powerage, Tom at the time, a guy called Jarhead, who, pff, no doubt in my mind, saved Stu Hale's life, his quick thinking, his quick actions, are what saved Stu that day. Um, I took over the treatment of, of Stu, and we got him to a point where all the paperwork was done, you know, he was having a cigarette, he was pretty chilled out, uh, morphine was working, and then we realised that we'd sort of wandered into an old Soviet minefield, there was mines surface laid, there was mines dug in, and it was obvious that they'd been fired at the hills back in the 80s and sort of worked their way down into the wadi over the years. Between mis- myself, Mark Wright and Stu Pearson, and we decided to move Stu Hale to what we believed to be a safe area for a helicopter to come in with a winch so we could do an extraction. 
Can I? Sorry, just take a step back. I want. Um, so, in terms of geographically, you had there was three. There was uh, there was there was three locations. Uh, the people who distributed three locations of Kajak. Because I was there. Just, I, was, I handed over to Stu. So I was there before that. So, I, for people who don't know the ground, you basically had you had two high high hills, should we say, and you had a lower sort of m- mound knoll, and and they were in line. So the the rear one, if you like, was where the company HQ and and the, and the main group of the company were um, defending that position and assisting where they needed to in in contact. Then forward of that, uh, closer to the enemy, if you like, you had so that rear one was um, not not Normandy, it was uh, Athens. Athens. Yeah. Then you had one forward of that, which had an observation post on there, which was called Normandy. And on Normandy, there was a, a a section plus or minus, depending on which day it was, and they were there on a little rocky outpost observing, engaging when they needed to. And then forward of that was another one called Sparrowhawk, which at this point wasn't occupied. It was it was used at different times. Um, now, that was high ground. And as you say, in the low ground, uh, so out of sight of the vill- the two villages, so out of sight of, of the enemy, of the enemy, per se, you had low ground where you could, you if needed, you could manoeuvre through this low ground to get to other higher areas, to get close at the enemy to engage. Sparrowhawk, an example. So the patrol... Stews patrol it led off 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 the hill off Normandy, left the hill, moved down into their ground with the intention of moving forward, getting closer within range of Stu as a sniper, within range of Stu to engage the illegal checkpoint yeah. of the Taliban. Okay, just wanted to give that overview. So cool. that K and a half you're talking about from you to get into Stu when when after Mark Wright ran into your basher, that K and a half was going from you in Athens, the HQ element, bounding forward. To get to Stu. That's correct. Mate, I know what that ground is like there. <laughs> How long did that take you? I, I don't know. It, it was the hardest run of my life. Um, I remember Mark shouting at me, telling me if I didn't hurry up, you know, there was going to be a, uh, one of his blokes dying. I remember telling him if I ran any faster, I'd probably die myself. Um, you know, bearing in mind, you know, the sort of nine guys who set off with me, all sort of power edge, you know, ninjas. And they were flying, you know, as soon as they found one of their guys had been injured, they were off. And you got a little fat old me, you know, with a 65 pound med pack on my back, trying to keep up. Um, but yeah, we got there. It, was, it flew, to be fair. It was probably the fastest I've ever run. Um, the pressure of knowing one of the guys was injured and the pressure of the guys from 3 Para, you know, it's, you're a very close knit unit. Um, and knowing that one of their guys was injured, they put a lot of pressure on me to get there as quick as I could. And, you know, we, we were there within minutes. It's by by far the fastest I've ever moved on these little feet. You know what I mean? uh, but yeah. And it was downhill, which helped. The downhill was the first <laughs> bit. Uh, yeah. And then it was up. For some reason, instead of going round, uh, well, thankfully, we didn't go around because we found out it was a my field. But yeah, we sort of went down, up, and then down again. Um, but yeah. yeah. The other thing with that, uh, the other thing with, with Kajaki was it, it was a weird place, as I as I recall. It's a weird place to operate, really weird, because in terms of engagement with the enemy, we, it was quite standoffish. There was regular contacts, um, but the threat was not as high as other pla- it, the threat of direct, you know, income was not as high, and because of the, the way that it was, I mate, mean, it was it was literally like living on a rock. It was like living on a rock. You you know, you didn't have much there. You had the dam, which you get down in the dam and get you wash your kit a bit, you know, depending on where you were. But it was, um, it, because you're in the sun all the time, I found it when I was there, super draining. I found it, uh, people, it sent people to do lally there. It sent the people I was with when I was there, a couple of them went nuts, just because, on that outpost, on that observation post, because it was so isolated. And because it wasn't, uh, the way you were operating wasn't pushing forward and, t- and taking ground. It wasn't what needed to be done there. It was a, def- it was a defensive posture. And, uh, yeah, I found it r- r- really, um, fatiguing in a strange way, mentally and somewhat physically, especially being on, on, on the rations, um, in the baking center all day. And I remember when, when the, when I, when I was watching the film, actually, when the film was made and thinking before that, Mind strike even started. People are a reduced level of sort of physical fitness. Mass- you know, massively, it- yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember wh- where my basher was on the hill. You know, if, if I got up and looked to my left, I had the world's beautiful view. It was a dam. You know, you're looking out there and it's absolutely phenomenal. And you take half a turn to your right and it's like being on the moon. It is just sort of dust, debris, and rock. 
uh, and it does it fatigues you we, we had the same <coughs> set of rations every day for the whole two and a half months I was the same there. menu the same menu <laughs> menu D can't be fast um, you know we, we lived on it and um, you know we had recently um, before the incident we'd, we'd planned to deploy into Tangi the nearest village we'd sent the sort of interpreter down there trying to get some bread and things from the village but he, he never came back um, so yeah it's, it was quite difficult you were physically drained um, even without doing much work to be fair and um, a lot of the guys were beat and but mentally I think was the big thing for the guys you know some of the guys had been there for four months you know when I rocked up and it, it was it was like living on the moon they were, they were proper spaced out but when it came to the enemy engaging us or anything like that they switched on and they were absolutely phenomenal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, get the stew Jarhead awesome dude awesome dude um, I didn't know that with Jarhead by the way I didn't know that bit because mm -hmm. it's not portrayed in the film like that is it um, I don't recall it anyway. But so Jared sorts Stu out. Uh, you get there, and Mark makes a decision to move Stu to where. So where, where we were in the in the wadi, we, we we had two sort of small mounds around us, and um, we decided to move him to a slightly higher point. Um, just one thing on the movie: the movie's very good. It's raised lots of money for charity and everything. But obviously, for the filming aspects of it, everything's been brought in very close. In real life, it was a little bit more desolate, and we had to move a little bit further. And um, we found a slightly high ridge, um, which we didn't have to invert Stu carrying him on. Obviously, we're bleeding in and bleeding out. Um, between me, Mark, and Stu, uh, Stu Pearson, we made the decision to move him. Um, we'd trained an old man prior to going out there, and we'd use lynxes as we winches, and that's what we were requesting to come in to try and rescue us. Uh, unfortunately, lynxes don't fly at that time of day because of the heat uh, in Afghanistan, and that was one of the problems that arose later on. Um, so, yeah, we decided to move him. Stu Pearson took command and got a couple of lads to volunteer. They got on their belt buckles uh, with their bayonets and they cleared a safe path and it was probably about 25 to 30 metres long, to be fair. And uh, during that sort of clearance, they came across a number of mines and had to deviate the route. Um, and again, the bravery shown by them young lads, because they were all young at the time as well, you know, 18, 19 year old, was phenomenal. And uh, eventually, yeah, the, the safe path was cleared. We got to where we wanted to go. And then we decided we'd move Stu across. We, myself, four stretcher bearers, and Mark and Stu Pearson came with me. We put Stu down. We were told we would about 10 minutes for the helicopter to come in. And uh, someone made the decision for everybody to leave, bar me and two others, to lift him onto the winch. And um, as all the guys sort of left and went back on the safe path, Stu Pearson was the last one to leave. And he got about halfway across, slipped on a rock, and stood on a mine as well. Yeah, so it, it sort of gone from bad to worse, to be fair. Um, luckily, there was another medic who wasn't attached to us on the hills. He was attached in with the a and down in the compound at the bottom, a guy called Alex Craig. Alex had heard Stu Hale's zap number being sent across Hotel Alpha in his last four. My zap number is Hotel Alpha, and my last four, Alex had thought I'd been hit. So he'd set off from the A&A compound at the bottom of the hills and made his way into the minefield and luckily he was there in time to start to street Stu Pearson when he got injured. Um, yeah, Alex, Stu, good sort of 15, 20 metres away from where we were. So you were with Stu Hale? I'm with Stu Hale. Stu Pearson had been blown up but 15, 20 metres away from yeah. you and he's in the middle and then beyond him again is the rest of the guys. Yeah, so you've imagine you've got the hill, 20 metres into the, the water you've got Stu Pearson, 20 metres out of the water, you've then got myself, two people, and Stu Hale. What kind of state was Stu Pearson? Stu Pearson had lost his lower leg at the time, not massively uh, in a bad state, to be fair, a lower leg amputee, but because of the blast, because of the heat, he had quarterized it quite good, and Alex being the medic, he is, Alex squared him away pretty much instantly. Um, so we've got the two Stu's then, both of them again were sound, they were sorted, we'd got fluids into them, we'd got all the medical sort of treatment that they needed, and we were pretty happy. Calm? Yeah, there was a, a couple as calm of, as can be. A couple of guys had lost their head, you know, seeing their friends being injured and things. Um, but yeah, as medics, I think both me and Alex were pretty calm. To be fair, both Stews were mega calm as well. Um, yeah, it was a bizarre sort of sense of bravery. How neither of them wanted to show weakness to the other one to keep the other one calm, and it seemed to work. And it worked for a long period. And while me and Sh me and Alex were dealing with the two Stews. You know, Mark was constantly fighting on the radio to try and get the evac to come in for us. Um, and it was a long time. It's probably probably looking at about two hours into the incident now, you know. 
Um, and then eventually we could hear the sound of a Chinook helicopter in the distance. Um, that sound, honestly, it melted my heart at the time. It was like that they here. I thought it was the Mert team coming in. I thought they were going to land on one of the hill posts, deploy some doctors, you know, and the Mert team down, set of engineers to clear a safe path and everything would be okay. Um, it came in quite low above us, hovered around, did a loop around the hill, and that's when we thought they were going to drop everybody off. But it came back, and as it came back across the top of us, it landed about 70 metres sort of to our west, going more towards the, the village of Tange in the petrol station, for those who've been there. And the pilot landed on his back wheel and ramp. Never seen absolutely anything like it. Um, I remember the loader coming to the back and he was sort of waving us to call us on. And I remember thinking that's another 70 metres through a minefield, carrying two people on stretchers. You know, it's not, not really a good move. So I tried to sort of signal him to take off using hand gestures, um, which has been portrayed in the film as me doing the YMCA. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, eventually he got the hint and he took off. Um, and that's where things got a little bit confusing. I think one thing with the film, it was very apolitical. There was no one to blame for anything. Um, in my opinion, other things happened. Um, I worked with the Airborne Forces for the majority of my military career. I've seen lots of Chinooks in my time, and every time I've seen them take off, they sort of nose dive and fly away. For some reason, this thing backed up across the top of us, and as it backed up across the top of us, we had what was a brownout. We couldn't see anything. You couldn't see anything past the end of your nose, to be fair. And then all of a sudden... There was flashes, flashes of light above your head, waist height, sort of leg height. Um, it was like a scene from Star Wars, to be fair. Which, what do you mean? Um, well, Explain it So the downdraft from yeah. the helicopter, as it sort of backed up above the top of our position, started to flick rocks and things around on the, ah. on the floor, a lot of debris, which were then triggering mines going off as well. Oh, so um, yeah. I did, ah. So this is a big sort of... So, you're, okay, my understanding is... In fact, no, you go on. No, no, but, So... Um, you're right. The film's air political. So, I, I, th my understanding was that the, 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 the that the, as the helicopter being coming over, I didn't I, I, that the way you explained the manoeuvre. I didn't know I did that, and yeah, I've not known that either for them to, to, to take off like that. Um, but my understanding was the the brown out in the brown out, a mine went off. I didn't know it was multiple, and that's what that's what the political side is. It, yeah. did, did the mine, did the brown out the mine off or whatever? But go, go I, I know I saw at least four. Jesus, okay. God, um, I didn't know that. Man. And again, they were they were scattered. They weren't all in one area. They were scattered around our position. If you think of the power of a downdraft from a Chinook, you know it can blow an ISO yeah. container over. So they weren't all being detonated exactly where we were. And uh, I remember watching one quite close to where the helicopter had come from. To be fair, going off and thinking, what the hell. Um, and it was the last one. The last one is the one that sort of stays with me. Is I remember looking as I was laid across Stu Hale's body. I remember looking across at Stu Pearson, and I could see Alex Craig was laid across him, and Mark Wright was laid across him, P protecting the guys, covering the guys, and covering their injuries. And um, as the brown house sort of faded off, I remember watching an explosion go off by Stu and um, Wait, Stu Hale, Stu Pearson, Stu Pearson, and. As the sort of helicopter disappeared, you know, the noise was all starting to settle and the brown out sort of clearing. I remember looking over and it was it was just horrendous. It was the worst sight I think I've ever seen. Stu Pearson had been hit again on his opposite leg this time. Alec Craig had been hit in the chest and Mark had taken one to sort of chest and arm and a bit to his face as well. Bearing in mind, you know, they're a good sort of 20, 25 metres away from me. Um, one of the guys who was with us, Smudge, his natural instinct was to run across um, to try and get to the guys and I remember having to stop him and a young fusilier who was attached to us at the time who was on the hill had worked his way down and uh, he came in and started giving first aid um, to the three of them I think Andy at the time was what 18 and about three That's months Andy Barlow, old yeah. yeah Andy Barlow um, you know and again he did, a, he did a phenomenal job sort of treating the guys it just got to a little point where it was too clinical for him. He'd not had the sort of training or experience to, to deal with them sort of injuries. And um, I remember one of the boys, I think it was Jay Davis, shouting to him, you know, put a tourniquet on Mark's arm. And he's saying, there's nowhere to put the tourniquet. You know, Mark's, Mark's arm was uh, badly injured. And I remember thinking to myself, shit, I've got to do something. Alex had been taken out of the minefield by Jarhead and a guy called Dave Prosser. And they'd sort of work, uh, work, worked him out of the minefield to try and get him to safety. Um, but Mark was severely injured. 
and Stu Pearson was severely injured. I knew Stu Hale was in a decent state, um, so I made the decision to go across and treat him. Um, How far were we there? About 20, 25 metres away. I'll be honest, and it's not something I say very often, but you know, we're, we're chewing the fat. I remember leaning down there, and there was a rifle on the floor, and I remember sort of grabbing the rifle between the magazine housing and the trigger housing, and thinking to myself, it'd be so much easier just to sort of execute them both and put them out of the misery. Um, and it was just a split second decision, and then I sort of gave myself a kick in the ass, and I was like, because it is, because of the state they appeared to be in. Because the state, the state they were in, it was, it was horrendous, to be fair. You know, Stu, Stu Pearson had took two hits at this point. Um, and, you know, Mark had took, you know, quite quite a bad one and looked in a bad way, to be fair. Um, but it, it was a split-second decision. That was a split-second thought. Um, and it was just feeling the call of the rifle. Um, and straight away I slipped out of it and I was like, nah, I've got to do something. There's a thing, there's a, there's a thing, oh, mate, that's, that's like six mines going off, minimum, you know, um... There's a, there's, a, there's a thing that's come up, mate, with, with this and with other incidents where you talk about mines and and uh, and criticism. Oh, not not of any one particular, but uh, absolutely it's come up. It's like, <clears throat> you know as well as I know, as well as Stu Hale knew, as well as Mark Wright knew, as well as Stu Pearson, and anyone else on the ground that day, that when you're taught about minefields or someone gets blown up in a minefield, the first thing you should do is not go in. You should... Well, chill out. If you go into the minefield, there's going to be more casualties. And one of the things I thought, which you're confirming for me now, is is I've tried to put it in my mind, well, there's one thing, you've got the human psyche. Well, that's great saying that. But when you've got multiple casualties, well, that's one little thing in your mind's going to go, I've got to go and fucking help these guys. Especially if you're down to one medic, right? But there's another thing where you, I've, I've tried to put in myself in the mind of the guys on, on that day. Because, like, Stu Hale, Stu Pierce, and Mark, right? Um, these are not sloppy guys. You know what I mean? I worked with Stu Hale for a number of years before that. One of the most professional people I've worked with. Mark Wright as well. Um, and, and I know Stu is highly regarded as well. Um, and I try to work it out. Well, why why would you go into the minefield? And when you look at it all, it's like, man, like you said there, and that second mind strike went off as Stu Pearson got hit. You're into that situation two hours in, which isn't portrayed in the film. In the film, like you say, geographically everyone's a lot closer, not a long distance. And time scales, it's really short. Yeah. It's really short. Um, when you're two hours into an incident, mate, and the the chopper you want to come in hasn't come in, you got a second line right, and then you got a third one in the brown out. There's decisions you have to make um, that you have to weigh up against risk. And are you correct if I'm wrong, mate? This is what I've how I've tried to reason with it in my head, you know? It's, it's decisions you have to make. Multiple casualties. Do I risk going across this to get to them to save them? Or do I just let them <coughs> fucking die? Let them die because who knows how much longer you're going to be there, especially when you have the the, the links revelation. Well, I didn't know that. that I didn't know it was a links you'd requested with the Chinook. I'd always thought it was a Chinook, a links with a winch. I, I always thought it was a Chinook with a winch. We just didn't have one, but the, the Americans had a, a, a black up with a thing. So it's like lack of options. You can you can say you blew in the face, dunk in the minefield, um, because you might get hit as well. That's great. Two minutes into the situation. Two hours in, three hours in, it doesn't wash when you've got three, four, five casualties. Uh, I think I think we all know, anyone, anyone who's served in the military knows, you know, health and safety is great and we're all taught to tick these boxes when we do our op tag and all that type of stuff and, you know, if there's a mine strike, it's in, don't go in. But they know farewell we will. You know, there, there's a, a brotherhood and a bond forged through the military and whether, no matter what cat badge you are, you know, if a soldier's injured, you're going to do something about it, um, especially if it's one of your own blokes and... You know, I'd, I'd trained with, you know, your unit with three para for several months prior to that deployment. I knew a number of the geezers, you know, and for me to put my hand up after the incident and say, do you know what? Yeah, there was two guys over there and I, I just didn't bother. You know, I, I couldn't live with that, to be fair. Um, so, yeah, um, there's a fine line between heroism and stupidity. And I think all of us sort of crossed that line that day. Um, but for the greater good. And I think every one of us knew the risks that we were putting ourselves into, um, but we're all willing to do it for each other. And I knew if I'd have been injured, one of the geezers had done it for me. And you know, I think that's what I've got to live with, rather than living with, you know, I never did anything. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Mark and Stu. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, so Mark and Stu had been hit, um, and he was trying his best to to sort them out. 
uh, and it got to a point where and Andy was dumbstruck. You know, he, he couldn't sort of go any further with his treatment. Jay Davies, who was over with me at the time, um, he was doing an excellent job of sort of controlling Andy, talking him through the process of, you know, I think Jay was a team medic within three para as well. And I was trying to sort of deal with Stu still because Stu was now becoming emotional because more members of his team have been hit and starting to blame himself and things and um, so I was dealing with Stu Jay was dealing with Andy but it got to a point where it became a bit stagnant a bit standstill the injuries that Stu Pearson and Mark had sort of outweighed the injuries and the condition Stu Hale was in um, and I made the decision that I needed to go over and treat treat them we didn't have any sort of Gucci equipment any mind sort of feel clearing devices or anything like that I, I had my med pack which was propping Stu Hale's leg up I remember pulling out from underneath his leg <laughs> and uh, Jay Davies grabbed me and he went don't do it I said what do you mean he went you've just told Smudge off you know for wanting to go over he said don't do it I said I've got to do it now I said I'm the only medic left and I threw him in Medbergen about a metre in front of me and it didn't go bang so I jumped onto it <laughs> um, I slid it out from under my feet and I threw it again and I sort of repeated that process um, one of the the big things that most people don't know about my career was I spent six years in the engineers specialising in mine warfare before I transferred to the med corps <laughs> and uh, you know I, I sort of knew the dangers of a minefield but it was I had to do something you know and uh, I remember getting about halfway across and I sort of stopped and I looked at back where Jay and Stu Hale and that was and I looked at where Mark and Stu Pearson were and I thought you know what the fuck am I doing tomorrow it's my son's first birthday tomorrow it's my birthday and I'm stuck in the middle of a minefield. And again, a little bit of me wanted to go back, you know, but Sod's Law, you know, sort of told me if I went back, I was probably going to get hit. So I cracked on. I pulled out my Medbergen again. I threw it another metre and I jumped onto it. And I got about, probably about a metre and a half, two metres away from where Andy was treating Stu and Mark. And uh, you could see the sort of look of relief on Andy's face. And he stood up and he shouted to one of the guys on the hill, have we got any water? And um, one of the guys threw him a bottle of water. He caught it, put it down. He shouted, is there any more? And he threw him a second bottle and he missed the catch. And as he missed the catch, he sort of stepped to grab it. And as he stepped to grab it, Andy stood on a mine as well. Um, so that was Andy losing his leg. Um, the blast from Andy losing his leg lifted me up off the floor. It lifted me off the floor and landed me on my backside. And I remember looking down. And again, there was a bit of a brown out ears are ringing you don't really hear anything and I looked down I was bleeding from my sort of shoulder and I've got no pain I couldn't hear anything I couldn't see anything really and I've got no pain yet and I, I knew I was bleeding and I'm thinking being dead's not that bad is it and uh, I sort of looked I thought if this is death I can sort of live with this if that makes sense um, I wasn't in any pain everything was okay and then I got a massive burning sensation inside my chest and then everything started to hurt and my ears started to ring and I thought, shit, I'm alive. And uh, I sort of looked across, I seen Andy had been injured, I seen Mark had been hit again and Stu had been hit for a third time now. And I sort of resided to the fact, do you know what, we're all probably going to die today. And I think that was the best decision I made, to be fair, sort of accepting death. Because when I accepted I was going to die, it allowed me to be freer and allowed me to move around. So I picked my Medbergen up I didn't throw it again. I just walked the remainder of the distance. And the way Andy had fallen and, and Mark and Stu were sort of situated, they were like a, in a triangle formation. And it allowed me to get in between them and allowed me to be to be free. It allowed me to move around and grab kit and do what I needed to do. Where I think if I'd have got there without, you know, Andy standing on the mine and, you know, lifting me up and putting me on my backside, I'd have probably still had that fear factor. But that fear factor had, had just all gone. Um, I got there, give Andy a tourniquet. Stu Pearson, all he wanted was more morphine. It was, it was like he was a junkie. He was just rattling for morphine. Um, and Mark, Mark, Mark was in a bad way. Um, so I started to treat him the best I could. Um, Andy sort of self-applied his tourniquet, got it on there, give him some morphine. Stu, he was sort of in and out of consciousness at this Hale. point. Pearson. Pearson. Yeah. In and out of consciousness at this point. Um, and again, every time he come round, he was just sort of demanding morphine. I remember going to say to him, Stu, I've got none left. We had no kit left. Um, you know, my T-shirt had been blown off me when Andy had stood on the mine. I'd had to cut material off my shorts to try and pack some of the wounds the guys had. And, uh, you know, I had nothing. I had no medical sort of kit left. And it, it sort of became a, 
a mum type situation where you, you find yourself sitting there holding people's hands and putting your, you know, your hand on their head and telling them, you know what, mate, everything's going to be okay. And when realistically you, you don't believe that yourself. But my job at the time was to comfort them guys and do the best I could for them. And clinically, and I, you know, I've held my hands up since the incident. Clinically, I didn't do anything amazing. You know, I think I was more of a sort of big brother, sort of mum figure um, for them. Andy, I remember Andy screaming every sort of 20 minutes after he lost his leg about the morphine not working. And I remember having to sort of debrief him and I proper gripped him and said, look, mate, the more you shout and scream, the faster your heart's going to beat. The faster your heart's going to beat, the quicker you're going to bleed to death. So you can do us all a favour, mate. You can either stop shouting and just die quietly, right? or you can lay there quiet and I'll keep you alive if I can, you know. And fortunately for Andy, it wasn't until he got back to Camp Bastion that they found out he was immune to morphine. You know, what a way to find out. Um, yeah, a bit of a shocker for him. But yeah, that... Um, that last sort of two, three hours when I was with Andy, Stu and Mark, you know, it, it, it was quite a an emotional sort of situation, you know. Um, Just come back on the timescales? Sorry. Cause so, yeah, so we're now we're probably, the whole incident altogether was six hours. I'm um, just short of six hours. From the first mine strike to the... To being extracted, yeah, six hours. Um, so, yeah, so I was with sort of Andy, Stu and Mark for a good two and a half three hours um you know it got to a point you know with the blood loss and things you know mark started to slip in and out of consciousness and you know, andy at times thought he was going to die you know Stu, Stu, i don't think ever thought he was going to die Stu was more concerned about his camera because he had some ali fox who's this Stu, hey, Stu, Stu, pearson. Stu pearson um you know he had some ali fox from when he was in thailand and r and uh, every time he come to he was rattling around kicking off for it um but yeah it was, it was quite a bizarre quite a surreal sort of bit you know with the heat and everything you know the sunburn and the blast and everything you know I, I was in and out at times and it was you know the guys who were over with Stu Hale and Stu Hale himself they were sort of shouting sort of words of encouragement to keep us going you know and every time I sort of nodded off you know Mark had sort of get me going again and you know I think you see it in the film the sort of inspirational sort of speech Mark gives you know, which was amazing, and it sort of g'd everybody up as well. Um, Did that actually happen? Yeah. Not, not in them words. Sure. Not in them words, but yeah, um, Mark throughout the whole incident, even with all of his injuries, he just laid there taking the piss, um, telling stories. You know, if you know if Stu was sort of slipping, he'd grip Stu and sort of bring him round, tell Andy he was a mincer and a hat. You know what I mean? And just kept everything going, mate. It, it was it was phenomenal for someone to be in command of a situation with such catastrophic injuries it was absolutely phenomenal and uh, you know it sort of as the incident sort of drew to a close when you know we started to hear the black orcs in the distance um you know me and mark had a sort of powerful five minutes you know where we a bit of honesty chat you know mark wanted me to pass on some messages to his families uh, you know his, his fiance at the time Gillian, his mum and dad and his uncle who was at the time the RSM of the regiment and um, was he under no illusions he was going then I think Mark knew I think Mark knew all along um, to be fair and I was quite naive in my thinking you know once I heard them Black Hawks coming in I thought all the guys were going to be okay um, and I remember when he was saying to me all these things you know and I'm not going to go into him you know it's, no, 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 it's, it's no. private stuff um, but I remember saying to him listen Matt I promise you you know I'll see you back at Bastion you, you know you've got nothing to worry about Um and then, yeah, the the helicopters come in to American PJs, who are the craziest people I've ever sort of met in my life. You know, uh, the first one came in, fast roped in. They were unaware of the situation, the amount of casualties, etc. What we had, they just knew we were in a minefield. And the first guy came down on his winch with a sort of seven foot metal stretcher and started dragging it around. You know, where we're all, everyone's sort of hiding and covering the faces. And I remember screaming at him. I was like, mate, it's a minefield. And he just gave me a thumbs up. And I was like, crazy. He grabbed Stu, P uh, Stu Hale, I think. Stu went first. And Andy, because um, he's taking one stretcher, one sitting. And then they came back. They did a couple of loops as they came round. And I made the decision that I'd be the last one to leave. So they took Mark, they took Stu, um, Pearson. And then they came back in and picked the rest of the geezers up. And I sort of had about five to seven minutes of my own in the minefield as it all ended and uh, everyone else had gone everyone else had gone and it was a real sort of surreal time you know the, the helicopters had gone around the back of the hill so there was no noise from anything it was just me in this minefield and I remember 
looking around all these bits of kit and bits of clothing that have been blown up and all sorts of things and thinking you know what i'm still gonna die you know i'm trying to lay my body out as much as i could to hold as much equipment as i could when the helicopter came back around for me and i still had this thought in my head you know i'm gonna i'm probably laying on a mine and when they winch me up i'm gonna detonate that mine even though i know mines don't work like that it was, it was quite a, a surreal sort of time to be in and uh, the winch eventually came down i remember putting the strap around me closing my eyes as i started to go up i was waiting i was waiting i was waiting and then there was nothing and i remember climbing to the back of the black hawk and there's still a couple of guys smudge was in there and uh, i was getting in the back and the american pj passed me a bottle of frozen water and i'm trying to drink it and it's just nothing and i looked at dan and uh, smudge put his arms around me and i'll be honest mate it was the gayest moment of my life we had this unbelievable cuddle you know no words were said you know or anything like that i think we both sort of shed a little bit of a tear um but yeah that was it we flew back round to the main hls all the guys got off back at athens back at athens and i remember climbing onto the back of a stripped down land rover and as i sort of pulled myself up i had some blood squared out a couple of little holes i had in my arm and my chest and that and i had an adrenaline down and i threw my guts up and uh, i got picked up by the scruff of the neck and uh, thrown back on the black hawk and flown back to bastion so i never made it back to the top of the hill and that for me was the end of my race if that makes sense i want to get back to the top of the hill make sure all the geezers were okay and then i know i'd be okay um but i never never ever achieved that i never got back to the top of that hill and um, that's one of my life ambitions that is that i'll get back there one day um but yeah got back to bastion um the guys were all being treated mega well in the hospital and then i just remember seeing a hospital blind getting launched across the ward and behind it was dave prosser and dave prosser was going absolutely mental screaming he's dead he's dead I was like, who's dead? And he said, Mark. And that was the first time I'd heard that Mark had passed away. He'd gone unconscious in the Black Hawk. Um, after he'd left the minefield, they managed to resuscitate him. And then when they got him into the the, sh uh, the Mert, um, he passed away there once all the geezers were on. Um, you know, and it was it was heartbreaking, to be fair, at the time. I really I really thought they'd all live. But again, I think it was a little bit of naivety. Um, since then, I've sat with... A number of doctors who were there at the time um, we obviously we went through the inquest and everything and you know looking at mark's injuries mark shouldn't have lived more than 15 minutes um, really? from his injuries um, it's just his character and his sort of tenacity which is what kept him alive to be fair and you know people ask me all the time do you mind talking about it you know do you get upset when you talk about it and i'll be honest mate i don't um i feel massively privileged to have been there because i watched young boys like Andy Barlow and Jarhead become men. I watched men, you know, who were seasoned soldiers like Stu Pearson become heroes. And then I watched, you know, heroes become legends like Mark. And, you know, looking back, it was a horrible, horrible day, you know, but it was one of the greatest things to be part of as well. Yeah, it's the, um, that's, <clears throat> I suppose that's the, what's the word? Not the paradox, the, the sort of the, the conflicting thing between uh, it's the, the pros and cons of such incidents, right? Yeah, definitely. It's so, only yeah. in such catastrophic uh, events um, that you see like the, the true ability. Yeah, you see of, the, of of human beings, right? Yeah, you see the character of men, yeah. don't you? That's that, that's the thing. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with some some geezers who I thought were the ultimate soldier, but when it came to the test, they weren't very good. And I've also worked with some young toms who were quiet and didn't really put their hand up, but when it comes to the test, they were the ones who shone. You know, and it's it is in that sort of conflict or you know catastrophic incident where people stand up and be counted, and everyone who was there that day went well above and beyond. You know. Um, biggest regret from it out of the 10 of us who went in as a rescue party only four of us got recognition for it and um that was sort of my big input into the film was we need to tell the stories of the guys who didn't get any recognition and you know people like jared like alex craig you know jay davies and that you know their families need to see and understand what they went through mm. yeah no it's um Did you? How soon were you back in the UK? Say again. Mate. How soon were you back in the UK? Oh, uh, about a week. Um, so I wanted to stay. Um, what were your injuries? Just 
a few bits of shrapnel and things like that and a bit of blast lung um, but I want to say I want to go back on the hill to see the guys and I want to see the guys who never came into the minefield the guys who stayed like Spud who sort of commanded it from the top of the hill you know I want to go and thank them um, for their efforts so I fought to stay um, and I was told that I'd only be able to stay in Bastion if I did stay in theatre um, and I was pulled to the side by my OC at the time he said listen get yourself back and get yourself to Mark's funeral and you know give him a proper send off and had as I said earlier on you know I'd, I'd promised to see Mark back at Bastion and uh I did, and when his body was due to go on the ramp parade, I rode the ambulance with him, and uh, you know, I didn't, I weren't lucky enough to sort of load him onto onto the back of the helicopter, on, back to the back of the plane. But you know, I sat with him for the journey from the hospital to the runway, and uh, and that sort of made my mind up, and I wanted to get back and go to his funeral, and meet his parents, and sort of relay these messages uh, that he'd give me. Um, and the army, being honest, did the best to get me back, but you know the RAF sort of screwed it up, and I spent two days delayed in Kabul and never made it back in time. Um, but since I've, you know, I've met his family on a number of occasions. I've worked with his uncle sort of for about six years after leaving the military, you know. So I've been able to pass them messages on, um, and I carried out what I promised to do, and I think that's one of the big things. Um, so yeah, it was about a week before I got back to the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. That wasn't your end of your career then, was it? No. Um, I left the army in February 2008. Um, so in November, yeah, November 2006, um, I had a call from a couple of guys in three part at the time to say, you know, stand by, you've been put forward for a nomination for an award. And uh, I was like, I don't want it not really interested in it and then on the 2006 um, New Year's Eve Operational Honours Award it came out that Mark Wright had been awarded the George Cross Stu Pearson had been awarded the Queen's Gantry Medal and had been awarded the George Medal and that to be honest that sort of changed my career massively and sort of ruined my career in my sort of belief what do you mean? so I became a, a poster boy for, for the Medcore and um, I had to go and have dinner with the Duke of Gloucester, high-ranking officers and very sort of wealthy individuals who decided they were going to map my career for me and decide what I want, what they wanted me to do. Um, I was offered to commission. Um, but that's not the reason I joined the army. I joined the army to be a soldier, to deploy and, and to do these things. And the career paths that they'd had sort of planned for me, I wouldn't have never had that career. I sort of enjoyed. And it came to a point where I got a post in to a training regiment for two years and I knew if I get down there for two years I'd be able to get my head sort of around everything <clears> and I'd be able to get myself physically fit and, and go again but also be able to sort of pass on the things you don't get taught in training um, you know when people say don't go into a minefield you know sort of advise them and tell them why not to um, I knew it sort of square me away um, but I got called in uh, my commanding officer at the time told me that he didn't really care about me as an individual um, but while he was the commanding officer of my regiment that my medal would stay on his books and um, it wasn't what I wanted to hear so I bit the bullet and told him I was going to leave so um, what you want to remember that was you're going to stay with the regiment you're not going to go to your, that posting yeah so that, that was it I was going to spend the next sort of three years because he was quite a new commanding officer at the time at least three years with the regiment where I needed a break to be fair um, both mentally and physically and uh, it, it was, wasn't going to be um, so yeah after a couple of arguments with him and everything and you know I sort of bit my nose off to spite my face being honest um, I told him I was going to leave he sort of dangled the carrot told me it would be 12 months I told him no and I was out within two weeks uh, so I found myself going from you know from hero to zero in a pretty quick time two weeks two weeks how was yeah. it so rapid Jesus Christ I think it was a bit of both um, he'd got the biggest dick between me and the CEO um, he'd sort of push you'll do the 12 month thing I was like no I won't I've got this medal I'll go to the press and uh, yeah it was two weeks sort of quick sort of turnaround how quick can you deck it I was like out completely tomorrow out. yeah so I literally handed him a quarter over went from you know having this awesome lifestyle of being a soldier having a quarter having everything to living upstairs in my wife's granddad's house with my wife and my kid and not having anything you know it was a it was a massive massive sort of shock to the system 
I remember you mentioning this to me the HR 4K event really 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 sharply mate um, I didn't know in two weeks to quit yeah. mate I would break anyone mate oh massively mate I would break anyone mate um, that's like uh, that's that's probably one of the biggest culture shocks anyone can ever go through I'd say absolutely so, but they took your quarter off you straight away yeah so you had a married quarter of the army supply yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was literally um you know, I got a phone call from the Adj, who I got on with very well at the time. And he's like, right, the CEO's saying, you know, when can you de-kit? I was like, tomorrow. He's like, right, de-kit tomorrow, hand your ID card in. You've got, I think it was 10 days you get for your quarter. you got 10 days. So I was like, yeah, sound. And it was, it really was just, who was going to break first? I think the CEO thought I'd back down. You know, I sort of thought he'd back down. And he just never. And, uh, you know, I sort of part of ways <laughs> pretty rapidly. And, uh that was the biggest sort of battle for me to be fair you know um you know i always talk about the kajaki incident there's been a number of incidents i've, I've been involved in and, and uh, i think out of them all the hardest fight i've ever had personally was that transition from the military to civilian life i wasn't prepared for it at all um you know i joined the army straight from school pretty much and uh, didn't know about paying water bills and gas bills and you know my wife did all that sort of thing in the quarter for us you know or how to get a house you know we went to Herefordshire Council to try and get a house but because I'd, I'd voluntarily left the army at the time I'd made myself homeless and because I'd made myself homeless I wasn't entitled to go on the housing ladder and I had to be out for 12 months before I could even get entitled to go onto the housing ladder I know things have changed now and councils are, are working with the Armed Forces Covenant and things but you know this is going back to 2008 and there was nothing so I'd gone from you know having a great career and I, I had a fantastic military career to winning this award where you get sort of thrown into the spotlight and you know you're thrusted in, into all these sort of environments that you're not used to to sitting upstairs in your wife's granddad's house feeling a failure you know and proper demasculated everything's been taken away from you you know you're hundreds of miles away from all your friends and you know your family which is what the military ultimately is and yeah that was the the biggest battle for me to be fair how did you deal with it <sighs> yeah it was a it was a bizarre decision. Um, I was sat one night, um, and I, I was going down. I didn't realise at the time. I was going down sort of mentally, I think, um, starting to suffer with a bit of depression. And it's only afterwards, and reflecting that, I'm able to identify it. And, you know, my wife was a rock through it all. And it was, I sat one night with a box, looking at old photographs, sort of thinking about the life I'd had, you know, um, looking at, you know, pictures of playing for the army, rugby, looking, you know, being on exercise and on tour and things and sort of regretting the decision I'd made to leave and I'd probably been out about two maybe three months at the time and in the bottom of this old dusty box was my George medal and uh, I remember picking it out and looking at it and thinking do you know what you ruined my career and I just literally threw it back in the box and within about 10 minutes of it you know and people say things happen for a reason I got a message on Facebook from an absolute stranger asking me if I was interested in selling my medals and I said, well, what would you offer me? And he came back with a really sort of ridiculous low price. I said, mate, you're taking the piss. I've had them valued for auction, so I know what they're worth. I'd not had them valued for auction. I didn't even know how you'd have them valued for auction. And he, he sent me a message saying, look, it's, I think it was on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. He's like, how much for you to sell them on Friday? And I typed in a figure and uh, he sent, sent me a message back saying, okay, I'll meet you in Worcester. Um, I drove across to Worcester, met him. He did a bank transfer, and uh, that was the kick I needed. That was the bit of motivation I had. I had this one bit of metal that was worth anything. That's all I had in my life. You know, I had my family, but this one bit of metal was the only thing of value I had. And my mental sort of thought process was, if I sell this, I've got to make something from it. If I sell this and lose everything, my kids are never going to be sort of proud of me, if that makes sense. So I sold the medal on the sort of mindset of I'll sell the medal I'm going to put the money as a deposit on a house if I put the money on a deposit of a house I've then got to get a job that can pay the rest of my mortgage if I then get a job that pays the rest of my mortgage I can then get a car I can then do this I can then do that and I did and it was the best thing that ever happened to me um, I sold the medal put a deposit on a house within a couple of weeks I picked up a decent job and I've progressed sort of through the system of work you know to the point where you know I lived in Kenya for two years as a director of a security and training company over there and now I'm working as sort of middle management for you know one of the world's largest medical solution companies um, so I've worked my way sort of through the system 
I earn good money and you know I've paid the majority of my mortgage off you know I've got three three amazing sons you know and when I pass away now there's bricks and mortar that they can sell and get more of um, and I bought a set of replicas which cost me 150 quid no one ever knows you know what I mean <laughs> yeah <I> think <coughs> interesting oh why well, I asked like, <coughs> yeah, how, you, how you dealt with it because it's like not an, it's not an uncommon thing um, to it's not an uncommon thing to, to not cope with the transition but but what it what is uncommon I think is is for people to be able to identify um, the issue that what the issue is or, or find something I mean you know you, you, you have to flick that switch and you you put yourself in a position where you ha- there were steps in front of you you had to take you know, and that, you know, that first thing, selling the medal, and you've got to take those steps to provide for the family and 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 be someone your kids can look up to, right? Um, and not a not everyone's able to identify it. Um, and a lot of times, the problem can't be identified. A lot of a lot of times, it's it can be so complex. You know, I mean, even even with you there, part of the problem is you know you lost you, you lost your family, your community, your military family, your military community. You've got, you you're on a path, a career path that you're enjoying, and it's going in the direction and it's going well, and then because of unfortunate set of circumstances, you go fucking Pete Tong, yeah. you know, and then because of the person you are at the time, you know, you come at loggerheads with a CEO and it's, it's fuck you, no fuck you, and and you end up where you are. Um, it, it's a, a lot of complex things, and often there's no one fix to it, you know, but you can you can you can do little things to sort of improve the situation, little positive things. You know, and and all big things. I mean, selling the medal, selling the medal is not a small thing. It's a simple step, right? Simple step, the right path. But it's it's, it's identifying it's identifying an issue. Do you look back on? Do you look back on it now? Uh, so it's the end of the career and regret it now. You said before you you regretted decisions you made. Do you look back on it now and regret it? No, I think you know everything happens for a reason. Um, and it's maybe the man I am. To be fair, you did. I'm trying to think what year it would have been. Probably 2014, I marched on the Cenotaph um, with the Gantry Medalist League uh, for Remembrance Sunday. And I sort of felt, I felt like a fraud, to be fair, wearing a set of replicas um, and not having my actual medal on. But then speaking to you know a number of the guys who I was marching with, they were all wearing replicas anyway because they wouldn't wear it because of the value. Um, so so it, was, it wasn't too bad. I think I made the right decision um, leaving the military when I did. Uh, I don't think I'd have ever been able to recognise that I was on a decline while I was in the military because of the bravado that we have to put up. Ah, so it's happening while you were in? Yeah, massively, ah, okay. yeah. It was a, you know, it all, I think it was all there, you know. I think being a soldier, yeah, we all used to drink a lot, you know. We used to play rugby all the time. and <clears throat> my, my lifestyle never really changed. It was my mental sort of capacity changed um i wasn't able to process things properly um and again i'd not realized any of this and it wasn't for a number of years after when my wife sat me down and went you know can you remember doing this i was like really you did this and it, there's a lot of things that i'm not proud of. i never did anything horrible or nasty but it, you know i said things that i'm not proud of and you know i'd go out for a drink on a friday night and i might not come home till sunday morning and you know i weren't doing anything wrong i was just getting on the on the beers with the big geezers and you know i put drinking and being around the blokes who were on that tour with me and you know going and taking my aggression out on the rugby field before my family and uh, I sort of feel bad for that um, but no I've got no regrets um, career wise since leaving the military I've, I've had a great career and you know proving people wrong you know everyone's told in the military you know, when you leave you'll be flipping burgers in McDonald's or you know all these inspirational talks we get when we're in the system don't we Um you know, I wanted to prove people wrong and show that you can be a success. And you know, it's my my biggest motive. And I think my my biggest fortune, my biggest motive is my family. Um, and that's a bit of a payback because I was very fortunate, unlike a lot of soldiers. I had two things that a lot of soldiers don't have. One was a medal. I was able to sell it to give me that kick up the ass, which was a big big help. And the second one, which I had, was a mega strong family. So my wife, in particular the things I've, I've said to her and the way I've treated her 
at times in the past, you know, just unacceptable. And she stood by me and she was solid as a rock, you know, and uh, don't get me wrong, I'm petrified of her. I know she'll fill me in. Um, but no, she, she stood by me and I can understand why a lot of wives and partners you know, leave the guys when they when they get out of the military or when they come into the end of their career because because we do change. Um, but no, my wife and my kids are my sort of ultimate, and uh, that's every day when I get up to go to work. You know, I might feel like shit or whatever. I've got to go and do a good job because it's for them and it's it's payback for what they did for me. You know, when I came back from Afghan, um, I don't think I had PTSD. I think I had what everybody on our tour had. You know, and as as horrible as as the tour was, it was every reason why any of us joined the army I think you know we all wanted to join to go to war and that at that time in Afghanistan we were allowed to to be war fighters and uh, it was a great tour and um, you know I had what everybody else had and it was losing the military losing that sort of family that sort of brotherhood and bond that that sort of caused my depression I think um, but again luckily it was identified quick enough by my wife um, selling the medal that he sort of gave me the kick up the backside that I needed to sort of crack on mm. it, it, <clears throat> it, the way the way um, from my own experiences and, and, and when I, my own experiences not just myself but other people seeing other people as well it's one of the hardest things I think to I- identify when you leave is, is you've lost you've you've lost a belief that there's value in what you do when you leave and you can't find something that gives you the value in what you did, and and that's value in various things. So value in the community and the, and the team you're working with, and and the value of the purpose of that which what of what you're doing, right? Um, and when I left, I went to the Middle East for four years. We were you know yeah. on the circuit, and me, it, it sort of I I went from I went from the military into sort of the military. <laughs> yeah, pseudo military, isn't it? Yeah. Same people. Right? Yeah. So, you know, same people. I mean, I walked on a contract, 70% of the contract was power edge and flipping half of them I knew, you know, it's like, Jesus Christ. Just like a big reunion. And it masked, it masked things that weren't right with me. In, in you know, probably similar things to, that were, you know, that caused your depression. Oh, that was causing you depression. It, like you're saying, it started even when you're in, you know. And and one of the things I struggle with in between the tours is was not being on the fucking tour because where's the value in what you're doing? Training, yeah, hundred percent. You know that changed a lot when I got my own platoon. I was able to get them up to standard and train them because there's hundred percent value in what I'm doing because I'm kind of save their lives and making the most capable fighting force to come when they go to Afghanistan. And then decisions were made when I was in, and I wasn't going to take them. I was going to go off to Sanders, and and um, that was, just, you know, that was like a, a loss of value for me. It's like, what, what do I do now? And I, I made a, a decision to leave, based on a few things, and that sort of that, and Afghan was finishing, and so that value had gone. Um, but again, I didn't address things I, because you don't, yeah. It's like you. <sighs> It's the mindset you have of being in the military, regardless of what unit you're in, right? Um, and it's it's that um, you you if you're feeling less than a hundred percent, right? You you don't address it because you don't identify weakness. You go and train harder physically, you know, not mentally, physically, right? And you don't address it, um, and so things things go on. And when you're so busy in an environment that you love, with the people that you love, and doing operations that you love, you there's no need to address it. Well, there isn't. But you don't feel the need to address it. And then I got out, did that four years on the circuit. And then it's after that, when I came back and tried to go into, a, like you, you know, tried to go into a normal life, your nine to five. Whew, mate, things just fucking crumbled. <coughs> Didn't have a clue. You know, he, and he, I sort of pinned it on everything else. You know, I pinned it on alcohol. I pinned it on... Um, Failed marriage or failing marriage, uh, a bunch of things, you know. Um, I, trying to find one individual, this is the problem. Trying to pin it on one thing and I, and fix that, I'll be fine. And it doesn't work like that, you know. And again, the fix is for the problem. The, 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 
there can be multiple fixes for it. It's often a combination of a bunch of different things. Um, is that is 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 that one of the reasons you got involved with like Hull for Heroes and the charities and that? To from a value perspective, um, purpose. Yeah, I think it is. It's, it's sort of self value. Um, as I said earlier, I, I was lucky. I I had this bit of metal I could sell, and I had my family. You know, lots of guys don't have that. And uh, when I first left, I worked with a charity called the Forgotten Heroes, um, based up in Leeds, and they dealt at the time with the families from the injured from the Afghanistan conflict, and there was no other charity doing it at the time. And it was a, a guy who was injured in Iraq uh, as a TS soldier who'd realised that he had no sort of care for his family when he was injured. So he set up this charity out of his garage and did a real good job. And I started working with them. And I started to feel a bit of value with doing that. And then, you know, I got asked to go into prisons and speak to veterans in prisons. And a lot of it, again, comes from depression and comes from things like PTSD and... Um, you know, I remember meeting one guy in there, he was on his third stint in prison, because every time he got released, he couldn't fit into civilian life. So he'd do something to get himself back in prison where he'd got routine, he'd got that sort of military environment. And, uh, you know, so we'd go in and, you know, we'd talk to them and, and, and look at how to deal with these triggers and with these things that cause anxiety and depression, etc. And having that ability to, you know, you're more of a man to put your hand up and say, do you know what, I've got an issue than you are being that big hard geezer who's hiding it and putting on a front and letting them know that it's okay not to be okay um, so I did that for a while and then I went to a, a charity event up in Hull um, a guy I served in the engineers with uh, John Hilton he was running it and uh, he asked me to come along and sort of tell my story so I did and Hull for Heroes were there and I'd never heard of him or anything like that and it's it was founded by a guy called Paul Metz and, and Paul um, was ex-artillery left the military found himself homeless and uh, living on the streets of Hull got given a bit of a uh, helping hand and now owns a very successful sort of building company and he volunteered to go and work with Nick Knowles on the big build in Manchester and saw all of this sort of community coming together very much like the military you know to build these houses and renovate these houses for veterans and he thought well if we can do it in Manchester why can't we do it in Hull and uh, sort of went back to Hull, approached Hull Council and sort of had this dream of doing a street and it sort of grabbed leaps and bounds now and Hull for Heroes are building the world's first veterans village. I've, I've read about this recently. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so it's self-sustaining. Um, you know, there's going to be accommodation houses for the guys and families. There's going to be shops. There's going to be, you know areas where you know we can agricultural sort of farming and then that food isn't sold in the shops and uh, you know it's all going to be run and it's the whole council and humber council i believe it is uh, who border in the patch of land that they've been given um, by the councils sort of crosses the two borders and they've both come together and said yep you can have it and uh, so paul and the guys from hall for heroes they're pushing and doing as much fundraising as they can to build it. i think it's 80 million they need to to sort of build it but they're they're pretty much you know, on the way, and they're getting a lot of publicity, and they're doing lots of fantastic sort of charity events and things. Um, when you do. say it's self-sustaining, what do you mean? So again, yeah. So you know, there'll, there'll be allotments where they grow carrots and cucumbers and whatever else, and then they get sold in the shop. You know, back to the guys. There's workshops, you know, for mental health, for you know, CV writing, for absolutely everything. So there's an educational pathway and a sustainable pathway. So they'll be offered jobs within the community and things like that as well. Um, and you'll be living with like-minded people. Not everyone who lives there is going to have PTSD. Not everyone who lives there is going to have been homeless. But there is going to be guys there. And again, no matter what cat badge you were, you put a group of soldiers together and <laughs> everyone can pull up a sandbag and spin some dits. And uh, it's a safe environment for these guys and, uh, and girls, to be fair. And uh, I think it's amazing what, what Hull for Heroes are doing. It's oh, it sounds the only remote on that. And it sounds amazing. It's interesting. I didn't know you... <clears throat> I didn't know um, you'd done work with... Um, Veterans and a Nick. Fun, I, just coincidentally, I've got a mate out next week. Getting out of prison next week. And, um, been in there for a year now. And uh, when I work with him, I mean, he's one of the most respected people who know him. He's just, he's one of those guys, you know, you work with them. It's like, that guy's just on the fucking ball, you know. And uh, got out. Um, he's 
PTSD, uh, alcohol problems. Obviously not now, we've been in the neck. Well, unless it got in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> alcohol problems. Um, I think he tried to top himself a couple of times. Um, but how the, f- how, the, how the fuck with that behind, you know, with that, I mean, just like top, go to top self, PTSD. Um, how, how, how the fuck has he ended up in prison? How has that been allowed to happen? That, you know, it's like, it, I'm, I'm, I'm generally, I mean, look, it's just one situation, but it, how can that be allowed to happen? There's a, there's a million reasons why, right? I mean, one of the things, one of the, the massive, massive things that you touched on there was the, um, the recognizing in yourself it's, it's that, uh, it's okay not to be okay. But I, I think, I think one of the, the pushbacks we get from, uh, ex military or even serving personnel when you bring up the mental health, mental, fitness oh mental health is that it's immediately got a stigma attached to it. but i th- always think we're looking at it in the wrong way and we're presenting it the wrong way when matt it's uh, difficult for me to speak to someone who do, you know you can see I, I know people and you see fucking hell man you're fucked but if they have a certain mindset or maybe they're still in it's so hard to break through the barrier or, or even the start of the conversation of mental health you know you just it, it's almost impossible sometimes how do you get it across but one of the things i think could be you know a different way to present it is this is the way i look at it now because i i battle with myself on it you know um to keep myself on top try and keep myself on top of my own mental health now because i recognize the benefits of looking in look being more introspective understanding the kids an issue what's the issue addressing it and then addressing it where you can or doing things that you know work you know like going for a fucking run or do a bit of meditation or um or whatever right but I try and now I try and present it as look when when you when you're trying to be physically fit when you're serving and when you're out, if you realise you're deficient somewhere in your physical fitness, you don't say, "Ah, oh, I'm weak." I'm weak. You don't not address the fact that you shit at push ups, for example, because you sat on the couch for your whole Christmas sleep, no. right? You don't not address it. You go, "Okay, I'm weaker in this area. Or I need to improve my prints. Or I need to improve my my." tabbing you know I'm, I'm fucking i'll struggle with 10 milers i need to improve that so i'll go out and work at it you don't lock it away and go into ignore that you go and work on it because that aspect of your physical fitness you need to bring you need to bring the game up the same it's it's exactly the, the same can be achieved your mental health it can and i i sound like i'm you know preaching when i mention this but because i feel so strongly about it because i was so in the opposite never even bothered addressing it and the reality is that as time goes on, as you know, and as other people know, as time goes on, the less you, the the, the more time you don't address issues that you've got, don't even realise you're there in the background. The worse things get, and and you end up, worst case scenario, fucking dead, or in the nick, you know. Um, but you should you you should look at identifying a, a, a mental, not illness, not weakness. It's not that. It's just that you that there's a bit of mentality you can bring on. It's, like, an, it's an injury. It's, it, it's pulling your calf, you know, going into some rehab and then going out running to get yourself back to your match fitness. You know, it's exactly the same. You know, it, you've got a small injury that you need to deal with. And, you know, that, that injury, for some people, can be small. For other people, it can be, it can be massive. Um, the longer you leave it, the more you train on it, the worse it's going to get. You know, and it's, it's having that ability to put your hand up and, and say, you know, I've got an issue here. I could do with a bit of help. And it's knowing where to go and ask as well. You know, in the military... I know the military's moved on a lot since I left, you know, with mental health and things, but there is still that stigma, you know, and it's, it's who do you go to and say, I think I've got a problem. You know, nine, ta- nine out of ten people in the military, you go to and say, I think I've got a problem. They're going to tell you to man up, you know. So you go to the doctor, you know, down the med centre, and the doctor says, oh, you, you think you've got PTSD? Okay, we're going to med discharge you. You know, so there's a fear factor there as well. You know, just people have to look at it, and the military and all services have to look at it, it's, a, it's an injury that can be fixed and if we identify and we treat it early it can be fixed but guys are fearful of going and seeking help because they know it'll put an end to their career and uh, the army's working hard on it the, well the military's working hard on it but it, they just need to bring it into modern times mm-hmm. that's also not it's not, that's the problem not, not just the place the military I was having a conversation um, recently with a, a friend um, 
he was ex-military, but now he works. He works. Uh, yeah, you know, he works as a professional. You know, in a corporate body, and in the environment he's in, is very much alpha male or alpha female. Um, and he and in his company, he was saying it's and <clears throat> we got on the subject of the listening podcast and and we are read and and he sort of he talked about it more or less for the first time with one of the blokes Amy <clears throat> and someone else and uh, it was a huge sense of relief for him um, because what he realised is that he's not on his own there's other people in his peer group you know from, from a similar background who are experiencing it as well and the reality is that everyone experiences right it, you get injured like you're saying, mentally, physically, that's it. You can't, you can't operate. You, you can't mentally get injured. You can fix it, right? And he was saying in his company where he is, it's it's very, very similar. He feels like he's he's not able to flag it up, you know. He so he's trying to deal with his issues himself. But it'd be easier if he's able to flag it up with the environment he's in, um, which is you know it's unfortunate. But I think I think you know I think things improving def- definitely in the military. But the first thing is, mate. Like you're saying there, it's like identifying it and and getting over the own stigma in your head, in your own head. It's it's normal. It's absolutely normal. There's not one person. There's not one person on this planet that operates at a hundred percent mental capacity all the time. In the same way, in you know, for their whole life, the same way, no one does that physically. No one does it physically. Everyone has everyone's an issue. It's fucking normal. It's just one of those things. Yeah. You know, and you, but but the differences with mental health when you got an injury. A lot of the time, if it's a significant injury, like depression, like PTSD, like acute anxiety, you know, um, or any of those things prolonged, prolonged a little bit of anxiety for a long time has a big impact. Um, a lot of the time, in, in, to enable yourself to deal with that, you don't, you don't understand the tools or the way to go about it. So you have to voice it. You have to, not, not publicly, you just need to go and speak to someone. Flag it up. Your GP. Do you know what I mean? G- GP is going to tell. GP is going to tell anyone anything. Go to your GP or speak to someone in confidence. Speak to someone in confidence, mate. I feel like shit. Like last few months, I feel like shit. Right? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about? This? As soon as you open up the conversation, people like like you and I are talking now. I've had these conversations with people who I'd never thought would speak to me about things, and only because they've heard people talking on this. And it's not just this podcast. Other other thing, other podcasts, other other stuff that goes on. They they feel inclined to talk about it themselves, which is fucking mega. But it's that getting out of that first block. It is. It is. And the way I sort of had mental health issues explained to me was if you imagine getting a piece of glass and put it on a table, yeah. and uh, if you hit it with a hammer in the middle, all these shards of glass go everywhere. Every flashback you have, every emotional tremor, every sort of freeze that you have is a shard of this glass going back together. As hard as it is to talk about it, the more you talk about it, the quicker you're going to bring them shards in. The quicker that and shards all come back together and that pane of glass is healed, so are you. I've never heard that now, you That's, There's a guy called Ron Eldridge. He was a CPN in Colchester at the time while I was serving. And the more you talk about it, the more you get it off your chest, the more things you'll realise and you will go through emotional sort of ups and downs, but then it becomes easy. Okay, and then you start to see the positives, and it's learning to take them positives out of negatives, which is what people need to sort of push forward. You know, if we look at suicides, you know, more people have committed suicide since the Afghan conflict than died in the Afghan conflict, you know, and that's due to mental health issues. And that's a failing on everybody's account individuals, you know, the military or whatever service they were in, and the government ultimately. Um, it needs to be recognised, it needs to be taught at school level that it's okay not to be okay. You know, everyone's taught if you, you know, fall down the stairs and break your leg, you call 999 and get an ambulance. But no one's taught that if you're having these bad thoughts or if you're scared about something, what to do. You know, so it needs to start at the root, grassroot areas. And again, I know the military are working massively on resilience training and things. And, you know, they're talking more about mental health and saying it's OK. But we all, we all need to do more. We all need to put our hands up. You know, as a as a 17 year old Tom in the army, I don't think I'd have ever asked for help, you know. Um but yeah, things are changing, things are getting more sort of open, you know, and there's lots of clubs now, you've got Andy's Man Club and there's loads of other sort of sort of groups where people can go, the veterans clubs and things like that. Get to them, pull up a sandbag, chew the fat, and then 
it's easy. Once you do it once, once you get it off your chest, it's easy. Well, it's the same reason why when when you meet up with the blokes from whatever unit you're in, like you haven't seen them in ages, maybe you meet up with one or two of them or like, however long you've seen them for, whatever. Same reason why when you're chatting, it's a completely different experience talking to those blokes or ladies, whether, you know, whichever unit you're serving. It's a completely different experience in the conversation you have. It's such a positive feeling. And it's a completely different feeling you can never get with yeah. civilians. And the only reason for that is they got you've you've shared common experiences, whether you've been on ops or not, whether you've been on the same operation, same missions or not. You've got common experience, you've got common common understanding. You know, and other other um, organisations and, and industries experience you know experience the same thing. You've got a common thing, and that and what you're saying there, that's why that's a positive experience because it's understanding. One of the, one of the things I hate doing. Like almost subconsciously, it just gives me a bad. I, I hate it. Is um, if I'm asked about different things in my career, um, different operations, I don't. I, I can't start. I don't like talking about it. I will, but in a much different way. I talk to the blogs. It's like I don't. I don't know what the reason is. But I don't like doing it. But stick me in front of the blogs. I'll talk all day. Yeah. I'll stick me in front of the blogs. I'll talk. Hey, and it's, it's the same thing with. Like you're saying, addressing the issues. But I mean, I mean, aside from this, aside from you know, like depression or anxiety or whatever, one of the things that's really, and this is recently, last last six seven months, a bit longer, eight nine months. One of the things that's really, um, I've really benefited from this whole sort of journey of discovery myself in sort of psychology and how, and this mental health thing, right? And the tools that are there to 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 help you through it is. Those same tools, man, they're fucking awesome for just day-to-day stuff. Everyone has those days where, as an example, I've just thought of this example really uh, re- uh, recently, where you get the end of the day and you're like, fucking hell, I was all over the shop today. You know, you, it's like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, you can't focus. It's just one of those things. Pre- it's not just one of those things, all right? So it's like, you feel pressure, you feel whatever, you've got shit going on at home, whatever, you've got a hideous task on. So now... Through, through what I've learned and the way I'm trying to like I said keep myself on top of my own mental health and try and force myself to do certain things is when I'm like that like today this morning man I couldn't concentrate at all I just could not focus it was all over the place felt a little bit anxious got a few things coming up one o'clock I, 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 I argued with myself for an half an hour I argued and argued with myself I wasn't in the mood but one o'clock I meditated 15 minutes I stuck me up on a meditated 15 minutes because I know from experience and this over the last six, seven months, if I meditate even for five minutes, my brain is reset, Tug. A reset, right? I open my eyes after that, and it's like I've just woken up after an eight hours sleep, and my brain is completely, completely different. Because I switched on. Granted, the meditation has that affects me, doesn't affect everyone, you know, everyone affects everyone differently. But the point is, you learn those tools, man, they can apply in anything. I've got a friend who does, sorry, I've got a friend who does, uh, so I, I don't think the meditate. He, he prefers not the meditation, but he does this breathing method, right? It's the Wim Hof breathing method. Wim Hof is nutless Scandinavian. Have you heard of him? Yeah, yeah. nutless Scandinavian. And it's Paul Godonis. So Paul is previous podcast guest. He works with Team Rubicon UK, and and um, and uh, he was telling me about it. I'd heard of it before, and he does the Wim Hof method, and that gets him firing. And I, I, he does it in the mornings. I think first thing like half five, six in the morning. That's like four or five minutes work time. I tried it once, flipping heck. I, w- I was ready to, I was ready to go fly into work, not not riding. I was going to fly over. <laughs> it's unbelievable. The little tools that you learn, they just they put you on a different level. It Never is. mind if you think you're feeling shit or not. It is. I think one of the big things with mental health is, as an individual, you've got to sort of recognise your triggers. What what sets you off in a bad way? Okay, and I think once you sort of identify what the triggers are to put you on a downer, you've then got to work out what your methods are to bring you back up. You know. My, my motorbike, absolutely love my motorbike. I go on there, I, I blow off every cobweb. Playing rugby, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm too fat, I'm too injured, I'm too old to play rugby. I still play most weeks just to get rid of any bits of aggression I've got, you know. Um, but for me, it's my kids. And every time I'm on a downer, I look at them and I'm on up. And it's, you know, 6 September 2006, you know, I resided to the point I was going to die that day. It's every day of my life. I'm thankful. You know, I've got an extra son since then. You know, I've got a son who was won the day after it you know and I've got a son who was three at the time and you know they're all grown up into fantastic you know individuals and young men and they're my 
thing. They're my meditation. They're my breathing. You know, so as bad as my days are getting, I do get some mega shit days. You know, I've got a picture of each one of them up in my office. I have a look at them. 30 seconds, I'm back in the game. So it's identifying the triggers that cause it and it's identifying the methods and you may have to try 50 methods till you find the right one. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know, it's like an alcoholic. You know, the first method they're going to have is not going into a pub, you know, but they might go into a bargain booze instead. And it's just finding that sort of way of coping and there's lots and lots of techniques it's worth grabbing a book it's worth watching these sort of podcasts and, and looking at what other people are doing but talking talking is the biggest one as hard as it is to open your mouth and tell you know about how bad you feel or what you regret or whatever by the time you've done it the fourth or fifth time it's easy and more and more comes out and then you'll remember things you didn't even you know you'd forgotten about and you think oh that weren't as bad as I remember and it does become easier first step to it all is talking yeah yeah, that's what inter- when I when I started talking open up about it. Um, there was things I there was things that I completely forgot. Bad things that happened that I completely forgotten as in myself. And, and as an example, like so I was I was talking to a counsellor and um, we we're talking about anxiety, and I went through a long period of hideous, hideous anxiety, fucking hideous, mate, and. Uh, I was talking about a panic attack and that. I said, I think it was a, pa- I think I'd had a panic attack. I thought, mate, oh, man, have you ever had a panic attack? Never. Mate, and even saying that, what do you mean? It's like, to me, that's flapper, right? Panic <laughs> attack, mate. It was, I went, my went white, mate, like all the blood drained from me. I was just, I felt like I was going to die. I, it was mental. And we were talking about that and, and, and it was, um, it was the last, within the last couple of years. And he's saying, why do you think that happened? Blah, blah, blah. Has it ever happened before? And I said, no. Nah. And then we were talking, mate, it happened three times before. It was happening years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, I'm trying to think the first time it happened. It was like 20, 2012, you know, when I did, when I hadn't even considered I was even, like, anything wrong with me. I had a fucking panic attack, panic attack. And it was over something tiny. It was over something tiny to do with work. And uh, I thought, oh my God. I come, I come, and then once I talked, then identified that you start, you, you start remembering and considering all information from from the past, and then it, it becomes more easy to understand what has gone on, what's happened. You know, I, there was nothing catastrophic happened to me like like you did, but through through being able to remember back, I could see that. I could see that, okay, a, a journey, a mental journey, and all of a sudden it wasn't a, why am I feeling like this? Why am I in clip? It was a, ah, right, I, I'm starting to understand now. And what it was is some stuff that was never addressed and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the, uh, and the, ultim- the ultimate, the, the, uh, for me, the, you know, the, the, that, that basic manifest, manifested itself in, two years of fucking worst two years worst two I wouldn't wish it on anyone you know worst two years of my life and it's like fuck me I could have been dealing with this six years ago See, that, that's, that's the big thing you mentioned there you, know? you don't have to be in a massive catastrophic incident you know it can be you witnessed a car crash on your way home from leave it can be you know an incident where you felt you couldn't assist or you couldn't help and you wanted to do more you don't need to be in these you know 72 hour firefights or <coughs> 6 hour minefield incidents it can be something minute but it'll manifest inside you to become this monster. And with that monster becomes a rage, it becomes the alcohol, it becomes the drugs, it becomes the suicidal thoughts. Get it out. Don't bottle anything. Just talk about, gob off about anything. One of them real boring geezers and just spin dicks all day every day and you'll be fine mental health. You know, just get it off your chest. And there's lots and lots of help out there. There's, there's an amazing sort of military and veteran charities out there um, who are doing some great things. One of the other charities I work with are Veterans in Action a bunch of ex-sappers from the Royal Engineers who, who've set up a mental health thing down near Tidworth and they do some absolutely amazing stuff with the guys taking on expeditions throughout the world and things I then Care After Combat um, which was founded by Jim Davison and Simon Weston I do a lot of work with them and with them on Friday there's a big event down at Swansea I've had a couple of them on and, the podcast um, yeah I'm, I'm down at Swansea with them at the, the football stadium down there um, they're doing a big veterans day down there um, all about mental health all about transitioning into careers and things and uh, you know so there is some absolute phenomenal charities out there and it just needs to come a little bit more from the government level never mind just the, the personal level as well and uh, but it is getting looked at it is getting addressed it is getting better but the first initial step is the individual has to recognise and has to put the hand up yeah absolutely 
We're going to start wrapping it up, mate. It's been fucking happy mega. days, mate. Um, back what do you mean, happy days? <laughs> I'm bored of you already, mate. <laughs> uh, any yeah, shameless plug opportunity, mate? Anything you want to... Well, in fact, where can people find out about Health for Heroes? Health for Heroes? Um, Google it, guys. Um, Google it. Get on my Facebook page. You'll, you'll see them on there. So we've got Health for Heroes, absolutely amazing, doing the Veterans Village and a lot of other things. We've got the Forgotten Heroes, sort of based out of Leeds, looking after the families uh, of injured soldiers. We've got Veterans in Action, dealing with a lot of mental health and things down in the Tidworth sort of area. And then Care After Combat, who do amazing things for housing veterans and dealing with the veterans within the prison service and the criminal justice system. So please have a, have a look at all four of them and uh, support them where you can. And then Monday I'll be able to stop playing rugby and uh, be able to retire and be a happy old man. <laughs> awesome, mate. Cool. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. Cheers, Cheers you.